<laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the April 24th meeting of the Yakima School Board. A couple of little business items before we begin. We do offer live streaming options for this meeting. You can find the link on our webpage under Find It Fast. There are two options for public comment this afternoon. The first option is for comment on agenda items only. The second is for all other topics. There are two documents you need to sign if you would like to speak today. Um, the sign-in form and the guidelines form. If you are interested in past meetings, you can find a link on our webpage to the Yakima School District YouTube channel to view past meetings that were recorded and posted there. Um, Barb, would you like to call the roll, please? Director Rice? Here. Director Navarro, Jr.? Here. President Walker? Here. And Vice President Villanueva and Director Beckett are absent. Okay, and Dr. Darling will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Jenny, oh, it's on. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Today, the schools of the Yakima School District rest on the ancestral lands of the 14 confederated tribes and bands of the Yakima Nation. The people of the Yakima Nation inhabited more than 12 million acres. Across Adams, Benton, Chelan, Douglas, Franklin, Grant, Kittitas, Kudikat, and Yakima counties. Today, we honor the native people who are tied to the land through history, legends, and cultures. We acknowledge their descendants who live in the world today. We thank the caretakers of this land who have lived here and continue to live here since time immemorial. An acknowledgement is a simple, powerful way to show respect. And you step toward correcting the stories and practices that erase indigenous people's history and culture. It, it also honors the truth. As a school district, we will continue to build upon our relations with the Yakima Nation. Thank you. And before we continue, we'd like to offer a moment of silence to honor two former staff members of the Yakima District. Betsy Broom was a longtime counselor in the district. And Carrie Priestley was a long-time self-contained special education teacher. So will you join me in a moment of silence? We lost them in the past week. Thank you. If you're interested in an obituary, if we have received a written obituary, they would be posted on our website. And now we're honored to have a few guests today. We have members of our faith-based partners with us today, and I understand they will be part of a report coming to us from Omar Santai, Santoy, sorry, Omar, and Casey Mitchell. All right, thank you, uh, school board, for having me. Um, my name is Omar Santoy, Director of Student Services uh, here with the Yakima School District. And um, also will be presenting uh, with me as Casey, uh, the Assistant Director in our department. Um, just, we are super excited uh, to be able to share um, a little bit about our department. We consider ourselves small and mighty uh, in the district, um, as well as give uh, an update to uh, you know, our school uh, counseling program. Uh, specifically give some information about uh, substitute Senate bill, our work that we've done uh, for sub substitute Senate bill 5030, um, as well as uh, the comprehensive plan that uh, our team has been working on. Um, and to share some information about some powerful partnerships uh, that we are proud of, uh, uh, that really, you know, prevent and address violence in our community, but then also, uh, you know, this will be the first time that we've will have been able to share with the school board uh, our partnership with our faith community. 
Before we jump into uh, the counseling and partnerships, I just wanted to call out that our uh, department is committed to be in alignment with our uh, strategic plan. Uh, you know, we definitely see ourselves uh, as having an impact on all five goals, uh, you know, and just honoring the commitments to our community. And uh, specifically today, we, we, I believe that you will see evidence specifically uh, around goal number two, uh, and um, also, you know, our department strives to be in alignment with um, our focus on teaming um, and, you know, the teaching and learning strategies to achieve uh, high quality teaching and learning uh, and the levers. You know, really, we think about uh, the teaming is not just internal teaming, uh, just, uh, you know, within uh, our district, but uh, understanding that um, the power and the impact and the potential of teaming with our, you know, our students, our families, and our community, um, and so, uh, you know, partnerships. Uh, the information regarding the partnerships will be an, a great example of that. Uh, I think back uh, to the start of the school year when we all jam packed in the uh, convention center, and we got to hear from Dr. Cruz. Um, and you know, one of the things that I walked away from that I felt was most profound was uh, Dr. Cruz really described, you know, one of his building and his work. But he describes the building as becoming a, a, a building that was a by any means necessary uh, building. Um, and so I really feel like uh, our, our district's commitment to teaming, our district uh, com you know, commitment to partnering with the community is a great example of us becoming a, a by any means necessary district. And you know, specifically when we look at our strategic plan, uh, the partnerships that we'll be talking about uh, you know, really do are called out within pillar two um, and in that we are in this together uh, and specifically you know uh, language found here um, talks and speaks to strong active relationships among students uh, families or family schools and the community and i'm going to have uh, casey mitchell share a, an update uh, specifically with school counseling well, thank you for having us again. We're really uh, glad to be here. It's a great opportunity to share a little bit about the work that we do. Um, we are going to talk about, oh, Barb, look what I've done. And this is why I don't get invited a lot. Yeah, one more, there we go. Ah, yes, hooray, hooray for Casey. All right, so we are going to talk about the counseling program and the other social emotional supports that we have within the district. And we are blessed and lucky if you haven't gotten to spend any time with any of our counselors. They are hardworking, devoted people. They change lives each and every day. Um, we have currently 40 school counselors, which is just awesome, I think. Um, 15 of those are at the high school level, 12 are at the middle school level, and we have 13 at each of our elementaries. Um, we also have one social emotional specialist at Adams and one social emotional specialist at Stanton. And I don't think that we are um, maybe on the actual PowerPoint. Barb, I'm sorry. I think we're on the. Yeah, I think. Well, yeah. OK, we'll, we'll roll with it. So. Um, when we look at other support though, we do have, um, with other support, we have student assistant professionals. Um, and those are folks that work with students, um, supporting students for, uh, and providing interventions for drug use, drug and alcohol use and misuse. Um, and we have mental health counselors uh, as well. The mental health counseling provides acute mental health care for our students in eight to 12 week doses. And so this is a great opportunity for our students that are really struggling with their mental health. Um, they are able to provide that in, in small doses at small times and then refer those students and do a warm handoff to outside agencies. So those students that are really needing that support and care are able to get it. Both of those, the student assistant professionals and the mental health counselors come to us through a, pro, a, a federal grant uh, Project AWARE, which is a grant that is based um, on helping students with mental health care in schools. So we're really uh, lucky, I think, and blessed to have that opportunity and those extra supports for our students. 
When we look at the comprehensive uh, counseling program, though, recently, last year, when we were able to spend a little bit of time with you, we shared with you the comprehensive school counseling program, um, which comes from the Senate bill, uh, Senate Substitute Bill 5030. And what it really does is it requires districts to develop and implement a comprehensive program for all schools that addresses three things, social, emotional, academic, and career development. We've been able to put together a, a powerful group of uh, professional learning community um, with middle school, high school, and elementary uh, representation. And they have uh, focused on the four sections, use of standards, use of data, use of time, and the use of, of uh, personnel. Really, the highlights come down to what you can see there, but really a focus on 80% of their time being spent in direct services and really looking at the standards that go along with those. We plan to fully implement the plan next year as we look at 22-23 school year. As you can tell, and we even have some folks coming in right now, we are really blessed to have great partnerships in uh, Yakima School District. And this really goes into the, we're in this together with Pillar 2, but I'd like to just recognize all of our faith partners who are here today, who partner with us each and every day to help our kids get better in so many ways and uh, help our schools to be better in so many ways. We're so proud to have you here. Thank you so much. We also have uh, violence prevention partnerships, and I'm going to share a little bit about those as well. As you look with the violence prevention, you will see that we partner with many outside agencies. We're really proud of our strong participation when we look at our uh, domestic violence, IP, intimate partner violence, really working to make homes safer for kids so that they can focus on school. Our handle with care, and thank you, uh, Sarah, who is here with us today for all the hard work you do with that. But it really informs our work as we work with students um, each and every day based on their recent experiences. And then um, our Gang Reduction and Intervention Task Force, or GRIT, um, really building connections with students and families to reduce harm across our community. And we have great leadership, great uh, participation in all of those programs. So. Thank you. Omar is going to share a little bit more about our faith partners. All right. Um, and as I do, uh, you know, common questions uh, that come to me is, you know, hey, so when did this start? And, and uh, how many, um, you know, partners do we have? Uh, you know, one of the things that uh, I just want to call out and and call attention to is um, and I, I really feel like I need to honor all the conversations, all the commitments, all the relationships that were uh, built long before I ever became um, you know a, a part of the conversation. Uh, you know I I know that people uh, in this community have been partnering with the school district for many years, and our our district has done uh, a really great job of partnering with with our uh, community and. So I can only really speak back to 2016, 2017 school year, uh, where I exited a building um, and, and came into a district-wide position to serve uh, here at, at the district. Um, and it was my experience, uh, my experiences with uh, Adams Elementary, and, and we had a faith partner um, with the Grace of Christ Church. And, and you know, I, I just got to see a lot of the positive impacts and, and the potential, um, and at the, Start of that year, we had um, of the 2016-2017 school year, uh, we had six established partnerships, and you guys can kind of see uh, some of the partners that we had. Um, and we started meeting monthly with uh, with uh, uh, faith leaders and, and faith-based organizations and staff uh, to you know kind of grow the partnerships. Um, and we were really excited, but by, after the first year, we grew to 15, um, and you guys can kind of see the uh, the growth there, um, and I'm happy to report we've just kind of stayed the course. Um, I'm happy to report that we now have uh, 37 um, at the beginning of this year, 37 established uh, faith partners um, all across Yakima, um, and we always have room for just one more. And so I'm happy to report that uh, we have uh, established. Uh, 
our 38th partnership, and that's with uh, Sun Valley Church, and, and uh, they want to come alongside and support uh, Ridgeview Elementary, so we're really excited about that partnership. So what's the impact? Um, you know, we have uh, folks in, in our community that are just in our corner, um, and they help us support students, so they provide things like mentoring, um, you know, they'll read with students, um, you know, sometimes that's just meeting basic needs if a family uh, is in need of food or, um, you know, uh, clothing, uh, you know, our faith partners, um, you know, really meet some of those basic needs. Um, they support our uh, uh, whole family, and so they'll, in some cases, they've acted as a PTA and, and help kind of reignite, uh, you know, a PTA or a PTO and, and, and encourage parent involvement or just serving the families during parent nights. Um, they support our staff. Uh, they've uh, written cards of encouragement uh, to our teachers and to our uh, our school staff. Uh, they've done things like host, you know, um, celebration dinners for our staff, um, and just put hands and feet in classrooms, uh, you know, helping uh, spruce up the place. And so, some of the campus enhancements they've came onto our campuses and. Um, you know, try to put some paint on walls or, or uh, you know, just work on our campus just so uh, our kids would have a, a, a really uh, proud place to go to school and, and just doing some of the extra um, and to work alongside us. Um, and rather than, you know, me solely trying to share, uh, we wanted the board uh, to be able to hear from uh, some folks firsthand. Um, and so we again partnered and reached out to a church and um, we, we partnered with uh, Yakima Foursquare Church and Brock Duffield, uh, who's actually here uh, today, in uh, creating a video for the board. Um, and so uh, we're really excited to be able to share this. So um, please enjoy this video. What we found in the community partnership is um, a really unique and positive experience, um, especially for our teachers. And my favorite part is in August, we get to come in for a weekend and I open up the school and teachers are in their classrooms. There's this feeling kind of walking in and looking around going, where do I start, you know? But all of a sudden this army of people from the community comes in and, and helps. Like the teacher kind of says, I need these three things done. And instead of an all day project, uh, this turns into a few hours because many hands make light work. And these are, these are people who are willing volunteers. They want to be here. They're excited to be here and they're excited to be in the schools wanting to help the teachers. And the teachers love the partnership. The teachers love having people in to help, um, especially people who are willing to help. Si la presencia de nuestra uh, colaboración con la comunidad de FED ha sido sentida positivamente por los estudiantes, las familias y la comunidad uh, aquí en Yakima en general, uh, el impacto más grande uh, de la colaboración son varios. Uh, yo diría que la, uh, los resultados son las sonrisas de nuestros estudiantes. En verdad, las sonrisas. Uh, también estudiantes atendiendo las clases diariamente y adultos trabajando en conjunto para ayudar a nuestros estudiantes y las familias. Por ejemplo, aquí en la Escuela Hoover, uh, tuvimos un día donde más de 20 personas de la comunidad de FED nos ayudaron a crear un ambiente de amor y de pertenencia para nuestros estudiantes. ¿Cómo lo hicieron? Pues lo hicieron uh, por ayudarnos a pintar nuestro patio de juego. Uh, hubo 20 personas aquí pintando, uh, arreglando el patio, poniendo cosas nuevas, equipo nuevo. Uh, y cuando los niños regresaron y vieron este cambio, hubo muchas sonrisas. Hubo niños que estaban en shock, pero creamos un ambiente de amor aquí en la escuela, donde los estudiantes quieren venir a la escuela y sienten que esta es su casa. Sin la colaboración que tenemos con ellos, esto no hubiera sido um, hecho. Entonces, este es un ejemplo donde la colaboración con la comunidad de FED y las escuelas demuestra que somos uno. Uh, so we find ourselves involved in Garfield Elementary School, uh, from playground rehabilitation projects to neighborhood cleanup, Teachers Appreciation Day, uh, Counselors Appreciation Day that we just had this last week, just celebrating them. And, and, and then um, even like reading buddies, where our people will be able to just 
meet during the lunch hour with kids and, and kids are willing to give up their lunch hour time or a chunk of their lunch hour time because a significant adult is going to listen to them read and encourage them. It's just, it's vitally important that we get involved in our community and this is a great way. I know a lot of people with time and resources and I'm connected with a principal at a school that knows what the need is. And to be able to connect the people with time and resources with the people that need it. Um, it's vitally important for the community, but also for the people that we work with in a church, recognizing that they can use their skills and abilities outside of themselves. Lo que me encanta es que el distrito escolar de Yakima um, nos permite y, no, y nos invita a hacer socios en la comunidad con ellos. Um, lo que me encanta de esta oportunidad de trabajar con las escuelas de Yakima es que podemos estar en las escuelas y trabajar directamente con los estudiantes y las familias de los estudiantes. El impacto que tienen las comunidades de fe en las escuelas no es solo importante para mí, pero importante para las familias y los estudiantes que van a las escuelas y las iglesias en la comunidad. Que somos uno. We are one. So I just uh, would like to end with just saying that I'm very proud um, to be able to share that video and this information with the board today. And um, I would entertain any questions or comments. Any questions or comments from the board? Thank you, Omar. I love the presentation and especially the video. I'm hoping that we could maybe get the video up on board docs for this for this meeting and that way then more of the community would be able to to view it okay um the other thing is i was looking at the list of i guess under the page seven in your presentation on the violence prevention and i understand most of well nearly all of what these programs are but can you tell us about walkabout yakima Yeah, so this is a great opportunity that folks have where um, they are able to go out into the community, spend time with kids, and really build relationships with students who are potentially going to be getting involved, at, at youth, excuse me, not necessarily students, but youth who are potentially going to be involved in games. And so yeah, spreading the word about that. So it's fairly new um, the last couple of years. but So it's essentially a, a gang prevention Gang, okay. yep, prevention reduction. Oftentimes, the folks that are participating in it have had experience in gangs, and so, yeah, so. Okay, thank you. Yeah. They're reminding me in intervention as well, so, yeah. Thank you. Yes, I just wanted to say a great presentation, and it, it really brings to light the, the valuable partnership that the school district has with faith-based organizations. And, and I've seen firsthand the impact, the work that they do, the countless hours. You know, I've seen uh, the members of the Grace of Christ Church. I think they're here today as a pastor. Uh, Alex is here and uh, Jake Cup as well. They, I've seen them spend countless hours, right? And um, serving as, as you mentioned, the bridge from the school to the community and accessing resources and you know, helping to meet not only the needs of the kids, but also their families. And which was, I, I thought it was just uh, awesome to see that, that community type of focus and helping to improve our community. So, and of course, Reverend Davis, he does a lot of work as well out of, out of his church and at a lot of the schools. So uh, in, in essence, I just wanted to, and Gerardo, he's here as well. He spoke on the video, so awesome work. I, I'm, just, I, I'm just proud of the work that, that you're doing and the school district is doing in, in partnership with the face faith-based organization. So I, I believe that is a key component to the work that we're trying to do. So I just wanted to congratulate you for all the, the good work and also that of uh, the partners and to keep up the good work and the partnership. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Omar, I just wanted to thank you for growing this program the way you have. Um, I'm old enough and been on the board long enough that I remember when it started. <laughs> And it really, it started with um, Superintendent Soria, but it was not at all organized like you have it now. It was a pretty loosely organized group and 
they only met, I think, twice a year, once or twice a year. And you, when you came on board, you kind of drew all the strings together and um, wove the wove the piece of fabric that is now our faith-based partnership program. So thank you for all that you've done to grow this program to what it is now. Thank you. Um, thank you, Director Rice. I just want to say I think it's it it is really uh, an amazing thing to not feel like you're a district in a city, but that you are, um, you know, your district, or or that they, that people would see it as this is our district in our community, and and so I think it's a great example of that. I'd also like to thank you and your partners that are with you here today. I think a couple of really nice things happen with these kinds of partnerships. One is. It never hurts for kids to have more healthy adults in their lives. And I think that puts more and more people in contact with kids. And the second thing is, is sometimes in the political climate we live in, there's a lot of bashing of public schools and what happens in public schools. And I think by putting people in the public schools and meeting our teachers and meeting our students, they find out that the public schools are also pretty healthy and there's a lot of neat work going on there that, that you get to see. So again, thank you for being involved with us. I had a couple questions about the counseling program. I have a little bit of interest in school counseling for some reason. But <laughs> I, uh, one of the questions was, I wondered what, what evaluation model we're going to be using to evaluate the counseling program. I know that with COVID kind of interrupting and now you're just formally adopted ask a model, but I'm wondering what, how we're going to be evaluating what data points we're going to be looking for. And uh, I also had a question about how many acute mental health counselors do we have working with us and uh, where are they located? So uh, thank you for those questions, I appreciate it. We have multiple tools actually that we're gonna be using. One of the tools that we will use um, pretty regularly to evaluate is something we've purchased as part of our Edge Climber program that you've probably heard about, and that is the savers. So that will help us understand where our students are and how they're working, how they're doing. So the way the Sabers works is that they, students uh, self-assess, but teachers also assess students, and it's done a couple of times a year, and, and it allows for us to really check in with where students are at and how our program is working. So the other piece is that in the plan, we will be um, reviewing the plan once a year, at least with our PLC team, to really get a sense for with those standards that we're focused on, are we making progress or not? So I hope that answers your question. Sure. Yeah, thank and you. I think Omar's going to take the second question. <laughs> yeah, and for the uh, mental health counselors uh, that are embedded in our schools, we have we currently have two um, that are serving our four middle schools. Um, you know, the uh, they are uh, uh, mental health practitioners, and they do provide therapeutic services. Uh, and then they, they also have the ability to refer out for additional services that they can't provide. Thank you. And they also have a related question there. What are, when we refer students out, um, we know working with youth and kids that it's not really productive to have them on a six month waiting list. Um, how is that working in our community in terms of getting timely intervention with some of our kids that are hurting the most? Hence the us uh, kind of starting to provide the services in house. Um, we do have long wait times, um, and you know we do have a great need in the community for services, and and uh, we are seeing some of those long wait times. So you're you're actually bringing up a, a great point. I think that we as a community, um, you know, that's a that's an issue. That's a community issue that uh, we as community, um, you know, need to solve, um, and so. I mean, our students, uh, I, I think our students do have a, a little bit shorter wait time than, than some of the adult services, uh, but uh, we have seen those, um, those time frames grow, and so we've had, you know, we've had to respond to that, and, and uh, providing some therapeutic services in-house um, is a good first step. Yeah. Thank you so much for all the work you do. Okay, any other questions or comments or from our superintendent? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so yes, I, I'd just like to thank as well our faith-based partners. If uh, we could have you please stand just so that we can recognize who our faith-based partners are here this evening. Mm -hmm. 
thank thank you so much. Um, it's it's amazing what we have here in Yakima, and I I appreciate the recognition of the board towards our faith based partners and for Omar's leadership, uh, Casey, uh, his support as well. Um, but to have uh, our faith based community come together under one umbrella uh, for our school district, which is for our children, is something uh, that is not the norm uh, in the state of Washington or across the country. In fact. I'm sure they exist out there, but I know of no other district that has this type of uh, outpouring uh, from a faith-based faith -based community, which then uh, improves our entire community. So uh, just my, uh, I'm in awe, uh, my uh, respect and appreciation, gratitude goes to all of the individuals that have continued to come on as part of the faith-based partnership. And we truly do want this to be a partnership. So uh, continue um, from your positions, please, to reach out and let us know how we can uh, support you and your congregations. I know that Omar and I and others have been able to come and um, speak at times and uh, share the perspective of the district, and we'd be more than happy to continue to do so. But uh, it's with much gratitude that we uh, sit here in front of you this evening and thank you for all of uh, your support and hopefully continued support in the years to come. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Thanks again, Omar and Casey. Next up, we have a report on our Highly Capable program. So I'm here to talk to you about um, the Highly Capable program. I took over the program last year, toward the end of the year, and um, one of the first steps um, that I had that I decided to do was um, take a deep dive into the program and kind of take a look and see what um, had been done and what needed to be done uh, moving forward. So. I'm here tonight to present to you my uh, three-year plan um, for our Highly Capable program along with some other information about um, Highly Capable in our district and, uh, and of course, uh, give you a chance to ask any questions if you have them. Um, so the mission of our Yakima Public Schools Highly Capable program, you'll often hear it referred to as HICAP, um, is to equitably identify and serve highly capable K-12 students in an appropriately challenging and supportive educational environment using trained educators within the resources of the district to prepare students for career and college readiness. Now this uh, mission um, is fairly similar to what we had had in the past, where, um, but I had added um, two additional items to it this year after reviewing the research and, uh, and seeing what um, I would like to focus on in the program. And the two items that we added were the equitable identification. Um, and there's a large emphasis both um, in the state and nationally on equitably identifying um, highly capable students and how we go about identifying them. And I also added the piece on career and college readiness since it uh, very closely aligns to uh, what we are trying to do as a district. Here are our highly capable program goals. And so this is sort of, an, uh, kind of a broad stroke um, over the three years of the things that we would like to accomplish um, through our analysis and, and kind of redevelopment of our highly capable program. And some of this, I say redevelopment, but part of that is was due to the COVID um, shutdown uh, caused some services to be interrupted, which also caused us to change a few of the things that we were doing um, in highly capable around areas of identification, screening, and, and in some of those areas. So some of this reflects that. It doesn't reflect the change in the program. Um, so we are going to um, do an accurate, equitable screening of our, and we actually start in our second grade. We screen all second graders, um, and we reach the recommended 5%, and the 5% comes from national research on highly capable populations. They typically identify about 5% of your, um, of any school age population would be uh, uh, probably in the highly capable range. It's just a target. Um, it's not a requirement of any kind. Um, it's just something that we look at as a way of, of kind of measuring our own uh, program and our own success. Um, we'll provide enriched, rigorous academic interactions among similar peers. And I've put a couple links in here today in case you had further questions about that. The similar peers link refers to what we call cluster grouping, which is also a research-based strategy where highly capable students tend to perform at a higher capacity if they are grouped with similar peers. Um, it's typically, uh, you'll see it in 
you'll see it started in elementary school and then it grows um, through the secondary schools. And you can probably guess uh, what that looks like when you get to secondary schools, because it'd be things like honors classes and AP classes, um, IB classes in those areas, you would see um, clusters of highly capable students. Um, we are gonna use a targeted professional development. Um, we will build instructional capacity of our highly capable teachers. Um, using the uh, National Association of Gifted Children standards. And I put uh, both of those links in there for you if you want to review the, the standards that the National Association, and those are also, the National Association standards are also the ones that OSPI has adopted. So there's no difference um, in that based on what the state is using and also uh, what we try to use as a program to guide our practice. Um, we'll also maintain a standards aligned program that complies and surpasses all state and federal regulations within the district resources. Um, Highly Capable is funded by a state I grant that um, the director myself fills out each year. Um, we identify strategies based on our goals that we want to accomplish and then we uh, build a budget to try to address those. And so this year was um, identifying um, students better and we are also um, looking at how we are developing our teachers and giving them the capacity um, to build uh, better, more rigorous um, academic opportunities for our high cap students. Here is uh, our current YSD population of highly capable learners by the number. So 74% of YSD highly capable students are on track in ninth grade. Um, 64.8% percent of highly capable students completed a dual credit course. 78.6 um, had regular attendance. Um, only 2.4 percent of the highly capable population were involved in any type of a disciplinary action and highly capable students um, have the lowest rate of exclusion from class. I'm going to pause right there for a second and see if you have any questions about the numbers. I know that those are could be a little out of context. Um, so if you had any questions about those, I could uh, I could answer those. Uh, what curricular year are we looking at for these numbers? Is that this, this is year? this year? Yes. And the link is also on, on that. The source link is on this. This is the 2223 um, state report card All right, thank from you. OSPI. There's also an interesting statistic um, that comes out of the research that shows that about 25% of highly capable learners um, I was labeled that myself, so I know where this comes from. Um, they were labeled as underachievers by adults. And then often that comes from two things. One is adults look at students and say, um, boy, that kid should be able to do a lot more based on what I know about them. Or they look at the student who's maybe less engaged and, and are probably witnessing a student that may be bored by the um, lack of rigor um, in a traditional curriculum. Um, and so those are those are things that typically come out when we look at um, highly uh, capable learners. And so that's why our program is so important. We want to be able to identify those students, target those students to educators so that they know that they can be challenged uh, beyond um, what would be happening in the, in the classroom at the grade level of curriculum. This is our timeline for how we um, identify um, students. And this, is, uh, been re this was revised this year based on our findings. So late winter sometime, and the highly capable nomination window is opened. Um, we moved that um, considerably forward this year to try to identify those students sooner. So that window opens and it is available to the community. Um, we post uh, um, in all the social media and public places that the window is open and we open that for parents, staff members, anyone else who knows someone who may be um, eligible for highly capable programming. They, they can submit a um, nomination. Those nominations can be done on paper, they can be done in person, and they can also be done online. There's a form online that we have for them now, uh, both in Spanish and in English, of course. Early March, uh, we screen all second graders using a modified version of the, of its, a, of the COGAT. Um, and I put a link on there if you're interested in uh, any uh, more information about the um, cognitive abilities test. Um, that is the standard for assessing uh, students in a wide range of cognitive areas um, for highly capable programming. Um, used nationwide um, as, a, as an example. Um, of, of one of the tests. Uh, 
that then generates a list of students that would be eligible then for a uh, full uh, COGAT assessment. And then we combine that using a multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary team to then look at all the available data. So that would include everything from you know, student artwork to writing to uh, test scores to uh, Dibble scores, um, COGAT scores, all those things. We combine those together into a rubric to determine which students would be eligible and would benefit from um, highly capable programming uh, within their school. Um, then late April, uh, which is where we're in right now, the, actually just today, we started the full COGAT assessment. And so there are students, eligible students have been identified and are um, given the full COGAT. Um, and then in May, we will provide those lists to the principals for their priority scheduling. And I'll, I'll talk just a little bit more about priority scheduling. Quick question about the Absolutely. COGAT. Is it, uh, how is it administered? So the, um, in the earliest versions, and I actually have um, brought with me, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll let you look at it. I brought a sample question for, so you can see what a second grader might see. Most of this is done online. It's um, online, okay. Uh, but it is not, um, it's not a text-based necessarily. And there are, if, if the student requires, um, if they, that sometimes they'll do those in person, one-on-one um, -on -one screening okay. uh, if they require reading. And then um, as they get older, the test becomes, you know, gradually more um, sophisticated. But that would be an example of one of the test questions um, that a student might see on the, on the COGAT screener. And, uh, and so that is, they're administered um, in the second grade classroom. All students would take it and then... Um, any kind of modifications we've made based on the student needs because no student is is not eligible to take the COGAT screener. Okay. Is it also available in Spanish as well? Absolutely. As okay. Yep. Yep. Thank you. So here are our program offerings as uh, as they look right now. Sorry, that's a little small trying to squish everything in there. Um, kindergarten and first grade, we can see um, students that are early um, uh, early identified um, as high cap, and those students certainly can be served not exactly the same way as the others, but we do identify those students um, early on um, and give them a chance to receive um, enhanced instruction in the classroom or at least targeted um, by the teacher to say, let's keep an eye on this student and make sure that they're appropriately challenged. Um, second grade, we uh, differentiate in the general education classroom and we provide enrichment programs that could be anything from robotics to um, you know, growing a garden in the window. Um, there's lots of different things that that could look like. Could be project-based learning or it could be um, individualized um, types of projects as well. Um, the uh, subject area and grade level acceleration is also available and that of course is by, um, through district policy if a, if a parent decides that their student is um, eligible for acceleration in that way. Um, six and eight, sixth through eighth grade are middle school students. They're differentiated in the general education classroom also, but we also offer honors classes. We offer algebra six, eight, and I even was told that, that there is a possibility, and uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Rodriguez, that there is a possibility of even geometry in the middle school if a student is eligible. Um, yeah, so it's a, it's a possibility. Um, services available during intervention. So when we have different times when other students might be receiving an intervention, um, highly capable students might be doing uh, project-based learning or other types of, um, of activities that are appropriate for their um, skill and rigor. Um, staff are assigned to uh, support and assist these students. And what happens is, um, and this happens uh, as early as second grade where we identify um, these students, we then, we then create an individualized learning plan for that student. And then that learning plan will follow the student um, for the rest of the time that they're eligible for the high cap program. And once you're eligible for the high cap program, you remain eligible until the parent exits you or you um, separate from our system. And so um, that plan, and I've noticed previous to me um, that the, the plans were not uh, kept electronically. And so I made that adjustment also this year that we're going to um, do all of our plans electronically so that the plan could then easily 
um, follow the student up and be adjusted um, so that each uh, new teacher that encounters these students then would be able to kind of get themselves up to date on where their strengths are, what their COGAT scores were, and, and really understand what the student needs in order to be uh, appropriately um, challenged in the in their uh, academic areas or in their creative areas. It could be music and it could be art, um, depending on the student. And then in ninth and 12th, um, we definitely uh, differentiate in those um, programs, but we also um, begin to specialize there. And so you're going to see that the honors um, track is there, the pre-AP, um, AP courses, um, IB courses, college in the high school. Um, we've got YV Tech, um, Yakima uh, Valley running, Yakima Valley College running start. All of those things are there. And this is where preferential scheduling and, and specific scheduling comes in because what uh, the research recommends, just like you would with other specialized populations, you would uh, provide preferential scheduling for these students. So you'd take, say, if I was um, doing scheduling for a group of students, I would take the um, highly capable students and I would plug them into those um, highly rigorous classes um, in order to make sure that they were appropriately challenged. And it does not in any way, I've had people say, well, doesn't that mean there's not room for other students? Um, but remember, we're talking about um, a very small percentage of the total population, and I'll, I'll talk about that also. So it does not in any way impact um, the uh, availability of classes for other students or closing a class because it's full of high gap kids or, or those kind of things. You wouldn't see that with this population. But it does, um, just like with our special ed students, just like with our um, other students that are in special populations, um, it does provide them with the most appropriate academic um, climate for them to grow um, the best that they can. And so that's that's really important. Um, so here is our enrollment trend. I'll kind of explain these um, numbers to you. This goes back 2017, 2018. Um, I decided to go a couple of years before um, COVID so we can kind of see that trend and, and sort of trace that as it goes. And you'll notice that the percentage identified uh, goes from 4% down to 2.5%. Um, but um, what I, what I want to point out is, so you look at that 391 number, and you say, wow, that, sound, sound, that seems like a lot less um, students overall. But you can also see the enrollment trend in the district is also reduced um, uh, as well. And so the percentage, if you look over there, since 2019, the percentage has only changed a small amount. Um, but the, um, and the total identified students, you know, kind of reflects that percentage change. So our goal is to, uh, through our new identification process and screening, to rebuild that uh, high cap population back to pre-COVID numbers um, around that, between that four and 5%. So that is our, that's our goal uh, moving forward. Okay, so here is um, our three-year plan. Um, I have developed this uh, through the use of a couple of different resources, um, mostly uh, talking to um, staff members and um, also we have a, um, a TOSA that has worked in the district for quite a while that really understands HICAP and she's been very instrumental in helping with this. And then of course, all the current HICAP teachers have been great uh, on this too and um, elementary principals that I've spoken to about this. So this then is a culmination of all those conversations to develop our our three-year plan. So this is uh, the first year of the plan, my first full year taking over the program. So we're doing our data collection and uh, on our current programming, and we want to conduct a deep analysis of program implement implementation by school. And so that's what I've been, I've been doing, looking at what are we doing for our high cap students school by school. Um, then we're going to hold one-to-one um, -one meetings and focus groups with highly capable teachers, understand what we need to continue to grow the program, analyze our population data for disproportionality, and that gets back to our goal of, of equitable identification of our high cap uh, population. Then we're going to analyze how to improve the identification process, which is the result of, of what we did this year to expand um, that. And then we will um, update that process based on the analysis and then revise the grant um, to reflect those priorities. Um, all of those have been done this year. and We're just about done with the very with the first step um, to analyze all of those things. We've got about 
uh, double the amount of nominations this year over last year, but I don't really want to report that as any kind of a victory because um, coming out of the COVID um, uh, transition, I think that's not really apples to apples <laughs> exactly because the, the nomination process is very different. Um, so year two priority, uh, we're going to, of course, continue to collect data on our current programming, make sure that we are serving our students appropriately. We will have fully implemented our equity-based uh, focus uh, nomination process. Um, we'll increase the percentage of students identified for high cap service and expand the professional learning um, for our teachers. And one of the steps we took there already is we have hired a half-time instructional uh, rigor coach uh, for next year. And so that person will uh, work closely with our high cap teachers, um, especially in the um, elementary and middle schools. Um, to build their capacity to provide the most rigorous opportunities for our high cap students. Um, we will uh, perform uh, regular meetings with our high cap ins instructors and students and families um, to ensure that we are providing the best um, possible resources that we can. Um, we want to further explore extended opportunities. We're looking at a, um, uh, my current um, interest is in, um, is in artificial reality and augmented reality. Um, based on the other hats I wear. And um, we are looking at a, an AI summer camp for our high cap students this year that we would pay for out of um, our high cap dollars um, that's conducted by the folks down at the faculty down at Stanford University. And so um, that's a possibility we're looking at. There's also a Lego summer camp and some other things that we're going to uh, put out there for students if they are. Um, if their parents have an interest in that. We, we often hear that parents of high cap students need more for their child to do over the summertime um, because they are, uh, they're busy people. Um, and then we'll also um, plan our um, parent family high cap education and outreach where we plan on doing um, some targeted uh, meetings and um, invitation groups um, so we can continue to find out um, how to best serve these um, students in our district. And then year three, so this will be 24, 25. Um, and in, though, in that year, of course, continue to uh, collect our data, maintain our process, continue to increase our percentage and hopefully reach our, um, our equity goal of between that four and 5% kind of rebuild that population where you are going to deeply involve parents and community members uh, to continue to uh, improve our program. And then of course, we're gonna seek a uh, new opportunities continuously and of course um, focus on those learning plans so that now that they're fully electronic we'll see how those um, work as they move forward through the system um, to make sure that they are actually servicing um, students as they're intended to. Okay, so in the future then if I put those three years together then within within five years our highly capable program um, you'll see a richly diverse group of students using highly trained and supported teachers using in, in effective instructional methods uh, based on those um, gifted standards. And we will, we will be able to provide methods, activities, and services that accelerate our eligible um, students and uh, lift them to their highest potential. Um, those are the three words I've identified as kind of our key terms for our highly capable program over the next three years. Uh, we want to provide equity, we want to be very um, intentional in our identification and that we want to build potential in our students because um, oftentimes um, highly capable students are not the ones who build to their highest potential. Um, they're often the ones who um, just do the work that's with them and don't always um, kind of reach out for that next layer. And so that's what we're going to ask our teachers to do is provide what that same next layer is, just like you would for a special ed student, just like you would for a second language student, is what is that layer that's necessary for them to really be um, the best student they can be. Um, those are our three uh, agencies that we work closely with, the Washington Association for Gifted and Talented, um, and the National Association, and of course, OSBI then draws from those um, two groups for how they um, develop and, and um, speak about their research. Um, we put gifted and talented and highly capable oftentimes get uh, included in the same conversation, um, but do keep in mind, of course, that um, it is oftentimes people mistake um, 
the gifted and talented and highly capable as the smartest kid in the room or the brightest kid in the room. Um, and that is not always, not always the case. Um, their capacity may be uh, among the highest in the room, but it isn't always visible unless an adult takes a, a really serious look at that student and, and helps them build that. Those students would be just as happy like any other kid to sit there and do nothing um, if someone gave them that opportunity. <laughs> and of course, that's not what we're going to do. We're going to we're going to continue to push them and ask them to excel and, and reach the the highest level that we can with them. And oftentimes, with highly capable students, it takes quite a bit of nudging um, because they they will uh, be more than happy to meet the status quo and not always go the next step unless someone is there to to give them a little nudge. Great. Any questions today? I'd love to answer any. Any questions or comments from the board? Um, I have a couple. We're, we don't have one page of your presentation in our version. Oh, really? <laughs> and that's the one on the timelines. Oh, okay. So if you could update 100%, Santa we will do Barb, that. the updated one with the timeline page in it. Um, I don't know what um, kind of outreach or advertising we're doing for the timeline and and if it's already done and gone that's fine um but i just wanted to to make sure that we get that current page in there sure. this the second question is um you, and you touched on it a little bit about your the the partnership you have with parents and perhaps potentially community members um, I don't do this often, but back in the day, <laughs> there used to be like um, a, a committee of parents and community people and teachers and such that was under the uh, highly capable program. In fact, we had, I can, re I can recall a couple of meetings where they came um, as a bunch to us because there was something that they wanted the board to be aware of. Um, it sounds like you don't have that now. We have, we've done that more one-on-one -on -one and individually now. And uh, since pre-COVID, um, I was not involved after now, I would love to have us um, get that back together because I really understand the need to find out what parents want. I've actually uh, been previewing a couple of books um, that I'd like to provide to parents of high cap students because I, I read in the research that oftentimes they don't know what to do um, for their highly capable student. And so giving them a little bit of help. And then also that kind of a group, I think, could provide some really great insights, um, not only for them to understand how to, how to help their high cap student kind of bloom, but also um, for us to understand what kind of programming and things we could provide. So I can definitely see that um, happening again for sure. I appreciate that. Um, and then the last question is more or less just because I want to make myself look foolish in public. <laughs> Can you explain to me what um, artificial reality is? <laughs> so I mean, that just sounds like, you know, some kind of made up thing. <laughs> there is uh, quite a bit of I love how my work um, in virtual and digital education interlaces oftentimes with um, highly capable because um, I get the opportunity to dive into some pretty complex things. And I am a, um, a, a, a lost programmer, I guess. Is, uh, I was the most popular guy in Washington State in 2000 because I'm a COBOL and Fortran programmer. Um, and as you recall, in those days, um, we had uh, quite a few things that had to be done then. Um, so artificial reality is now, um, and uh, I'll, I'll talk to Dr. Rodriguez and, and, uh, and Dr. Green, and I'd love uh, to come and talk to the board about that. Uh, it is my current, uh, it is my current uh, dream uh, right now. Um, it is, what's happening right now is that the private enterprise has introduced the idea of a neural engine. And a neural engine then allows us to use our voice to ask a computer to return uh, evidence to us. And so if I said, write me a poem about Martha Rice, it would do that for me. 
Now that'd be scary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a very deep topic, and I promised Jenny. I I I really I promised Jenny I wouldn't bird walk, and so and look where I am. <laughs> but Thank I would you. be I'd be very happy. I think that there is some some big conversations coming around um, artificial reality and augmented reality. But uh, um, I, I I'm happy to be the um, person that continues to watch those conversations and 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 help uh, support the district in that area because it is a it's a very important um, topic that will impact every single student in our K twelve system if it hasn't already. And it will also impact um, every person in our world if it hasn't already. Thank you, Arnie. It's been a very long time since we've had a presentation on the high cap <laughs> program. So thank you for you this bet. information. Any, any other questions? Yeah. Raymond, do you have any questions? Again? Yes, I do have a, a couple questions. So I'm just wondering about the equitable screening and identification, uh, if you could elaborate on that. And then specifically, I have questions on um, just the process. So you mentioned, or this, up there it says that in March, that all second graders are screen, pre -screen, do the, the brief screening. Yep. Right. And then, if what, according to those results, they can move on to the full. So, that's correct. I'm just wondering is that the only time students are assessed or can they and enter the program in the second grade? Can sure. they, what if they're in the kindergarten or first grade? Yeah, and I, what if they're like in fifth grade or sixth grade or whatever? So, I'm sure, just wondering about that out. those entry points into the program. So I'm just kind of wondering about that because there seems, and then also just, I'm just curious about the nominations process because if they're all being tested and they move on through the process, how does that nominations process work and fit into the overall? Sure. Uh, and that, so, so what we recognized from the data was that the nomination process was not accurately capturing all of our students, um, that we knew there was more highly capable students out there than what were being identified through the nomination process. Because the nomination process, although still a, a, uh, a vital part of our program, because it can capture student in any grade, uh, any student in any grade can be nominated. Um, but for the busy parent or the parent who doesn't have access to a computer, the parent that doesn't have time to do that, that's not a very equitable way to do it. So the idea was then we would begin screening every second grader with a, uh, a smaller version, a screener version of the COGAT. And then from there, then um, those students would move on to be eligible, although that requires parent permission. So we just finished um, notifying, uh, I think, about around 100 uh, families um, that their students had been elevated to um, eligible to be fully screened. And we got 100, I think, parents who said yes, not one parent said no. Mm -hmm. And so then we uh, take all of those students then and move them on to the um, full the full COGAT um, battery. And then that becomes another piece of their data that would then become um, accessible to the multidisciplinary team to identify them for um, services. But at any point during the nomination windows of any year, so during that um, period of time, and I usually run it, well, since I've been here, I run it about a month and a half or so. Um, for about a month and a half, that window is open and we continuously um, advertise it with the help of our friends in communications um, to make sure that it's out there as much as we can. And I will be the first to admit we can do better. Um, I think um, next year I plan to make posters um, and some other things as well. Um, but then during that window, then any student in any grade um, could be nominated by a parent, a staff member or a community member um, for then they would be screened and then uh, see if they're el also eligible to be um, fully tested for the COGAT. Okay, thank you. And then also, we don't have to do it today, but I'd like to see some disaggregated data. I know you mentioned Absolutely. a deep dive. Yep, so, and we're, we're, de we're deeply into that right okay. now. And what I want to do, what I'm trying to do is give us the data across the years that I identified so that I can show if our goals are actually meeting what we're trying to do, because it's very important to me um, that we equitably identify. And so I want to be able to have a, a fairly good cohort set of data so that we can look at that. And I'm, I've broken it down um, district, state, um, and uh, by program. And then what we'll have for you is then you'll be able to see um, this data across all of those programs and by their federally identified race. Mm -hmm. um, no need, no need for you know names or grades or anything like that. Yeah. Um, just uh, to see if we are equitably identifying. And my personal goal, of course, is to match that um, 
data with our demographic data in our district. Um, I think that would be a good place to start to say, are we accurately identifying students? Thank you. Yeah. I, had a, I had a couple of questions also, and, and Director Navarro asked several of the ones that I was interested in, so thank you, I can save time there. But I had a couple other questions. Um, of our 391 kids that are currently identified and in the program, do they tend to be spread out around the district or are they kind of in pockets maybe in certain schools? They are, they are very spread out. And actually um, I did sort of a, um, what, I, what I sort of estimated. And then when I went out to look at the actual data, um, they're obviously the highest percentage is, is in the upper grades um, because of COVID. Um, but uh, we tend to see them not in any great concentration at any elementary versus another. And we also don't see them, we don't tend to see them in great concentrations in grade levels, which is a challenge for me. <laughs> because when you try to cluster group students when you only have two in the, in the second grade at a building, um, then obviously the two can be together, but the real benefit would be if we could make the groups bigger. So we're looking at ways to do some possible um, cross-grade um, opportunities for kids as well. And a related, not a related question, a question that's kind of has to do with the identified kids. Are they on some kind of an individualized education plan? Yes, they are. Specifically for each other. Um, once they have been, um, once they go through the process, then another letter goes to the parent that says, hey, um, your student would benefit from, just like you would with a special ed student, right. we would say your student would benefit from highly capable programming. Do you want them in? If they say yes, then at the very next conference, and we typically try to line those up so it's first conference in the year, then the parent would sit down across from the teacher and help them develop a very specific plan for the student to follow. Okay, thank you. And one final question it has to do with funding, and maybe this is a question for the <laughs> superintendent or for our finance, finance director, but will gifted and talented high cap students benefit from the current increase in funding in special education. Are there dollars in that earmarked for? I would say no, but I've been told by Mr. Cooper that our funding is unlimited. And so that really, that works out really well. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, the, yeah, the funding for HICAP is based on a percentage of identified, and that's a set number from the state based on your total population. And that is all done through the I-grant process uh, currently through OSPI. Okay. Um, so it's a fairly set um, number. It does not, some people have asked me, oh, why would you want to identify more? Because then there'd be less funding available. Um, but I think when you talk about it in terms of equity, I don't think you should even, that shouldn't even be a topic. I think you just adjust what you're doing to make sure you're serving every kid equitably. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. You bet. Um, I, I do have just, just heard something. So, and you don't have to answer it right now. So I, I'm just thinking in terms of the screening process, if they, go through the whole process, why not just automatically enroll them into the program? Do we need parental well, consent? That's, that's so, a great, uh, uh, I'm glad you're thinking like that because yeah. um, one of the things that Dr. Rodriguez and I've talked about is, is really trying to make sure we keep that group identified. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you that overall, um, probably I would say in the two to 4% of them do not qualify. Um, so once they land there, a fairly high percentage of them qualify because they have been accurately screened mm -hmm. and, and identified. And the ones that don't qualify are the ones that, you know, did something crazy on the screener. And then when they did the next, when they looked at the rest of the data, they said, this student, and it's not to say the student's not bright. They're just saying that this student would not benefit from additional um, rigor in their, in their day. Um, they would, they're being, they're being served exactly um, like they should be um, currently. And so, but it's a great conversation for us to have in the future to say, um, wouldn't it be amazing if we could continue to identify those students, anyone that was nominated and say, let's keep an eye on that kid um, because they could benefit from all the great things that are happening um, academically. Or just automatically enroll them in the program and yeah, I'm not like sure. It's, yeah, I don't know if we can do that. But. Yeah, I'm not sure the feds would, be, uh, would smile on that. But <laughs> yes, <laughs> we uh, we could certainly look at that. Oh. Any other questions? I appreciate your time today. Any other questions, Dr. Green? Would you like to add any comments or questions? No more questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, moving on. Do we have any updates from members of the board? 
Well, as you probably know, the legislature did finally reach agreement late yesterday on the budget. And so um, I know WASDA and I expect the rest of the, all of the lobbyists and, and folks in Olympia um, are busy kind of delving into all of the intricacies of the budget and identifying what that's going to look like and how that's going to impact their particular area of interest. Um, I know that WASDA is going to be updating and sending out information about that, I think by Thursday of this week. So if you are, um, if you are subscribed to the in session document that comes from WASDA, um, that will be kind of the condensed version of what the budget will look like for public schools, public education for this next two years. Um, and now that that particular focus is done, we get to turn make a quick pivot to the upcoming um, the upcoming proposal window. Mm -hmm. that I talked about last week that I would really like to get on as an agenda item within the next couple of weeks Oh, okay. because the board has to approve any proposal that we want to put forward and the window expires in 18 days. Duly noted. <laughs> so if, um, if board members are interested, they can go to um, the WASDA webpage under, what is it, um, about, the about heading, and check on, go down and look through the legislative, legislative priorities, and that will give you the information that um, we Dis discussed and, and debated at uh, last year's General Assembly. Um, as you know, um, the items that, that are on the assembly have to be placed there by, by boards before they can be addressed. And if the proposals don't come forward from individual boards, then it's likely that it won't make the list. So um, look at that. And if there's something in there that, um, you, that you want to have come back, we can um, resurrect that proposal. Or if there's something that um, kind of tweaks your brain and well, we should have a proposal about this, um, then we can work on that. But we only have 18 days left in the window. While you're here and discussing it, was there anything specific you had in mind for any of those? Um, the one, the one that, um, where is it? There it is. The one that we proposed last year um, that I think, because it's a, it's a big topic and it's, brand, it's fairly new, um, would be uh, the equity-based formula, creating an equity-based formula for uh, public schools, the education funding model. Okay. So revising the prototypical school model and turn it into an equity-based model. Oh, okay. Because we know that the prototypical school model is not equitable. Yeah. Okay. So I've got, I've got that language. Um, but there may be other things that that folks want to sure. discuss. Sure. So, okay. If nothing else, I will have that language before the eighteenth, before okay. the twelfth, okay. and um, okay. have it just propose it as a regular agenda item. Okay, we'll just get it on our agenda to okay. field any of those proposals. Though. All right, thanks. Okay. Any uh, any other things from Raymond? I have nothing to report today. Um, Dr. Green, superintendent's update. 
Uh, thank you, uh, members of the board, uh, President Walker. I'd just like to start by sharing a reminder about our district's equity definition, which is, as you can see, the condition that would be achieved if one's group's membership no longer predicated in a statistical sense, how one fares, and we recognize equity as the outcome, not just the access to opportunity. So we continue to work with this under this uh, definition to make sure that we have uh, equitable opportunities scaffold for our students, which is, of course, an ongoing process. And then by just a way of reminder, the April's character word is adaptable, uh, capable of being or, or becoming adapted, uh, able to adjust to new conditions, which I'll address in just a moment. And uh, in Spanish, adaptable, capaz de adaptarse o de ser adaptado, capaz de ajustarse a nuevas condiciones. The trait is community and globally connected and the characteristic connected with the community and with the world. So I will come right back to that one and talk about how adaptability has played a role in my life in the last week. <laughs> but before that, let's do what really needs to be done today. And that is uh, the fun time here of recognizing somebody in our audience here. So I'm gonna invite Sarah Cordova, our Director of Athletics and Safety and Security uh, to the podium, please, if you would. Yeah. And we are really excited about the Community in Excellence Award that was uh, given to Sarah from our uh, Yakima Police Department. Uh, so this happened within the last month. And I'd just like to read this to you. Uh, so again, just think about the wonderful personnel that we have working for us. And oftentimes uh, what they do goes unrecognized. It's so nice uh, when it goes recognized internally, but also then externally through our community. So it reads, Community Excellence Award awarded to Sarah Cordova. The mission of the Yakima Police Department is to partner with the community to reduce violent crime while always providing exceptional customer service. The third annual uh, 2022 Community Excellence Awards nominated by the Chief of Police, Matt Murray, parallels with the mission statement and goals of the department while going above and beyond the duties of an employee. In the spring of 2021, the city of Yakima embarked on the difficult task of creating a coalition and process to combat domestic violence. Very early in that endeavor, the Yakima School District and specifically Sarah Cordova demonstrated clear commitment and collaboration. One of the early identified tasks was to create a system to better address the needs of children affected by domestic violence. Borrowing from the Spokane Domestic Violence Coalition, Yakima adapted the Handle with Care program. Although there are numerous people involved in the program on a daily basis, no one has embraced it and assured its success like Sarah Cordova. Her zeal in, in personally learning the dynamics of the families and children impacted by domestic violence is humbling. The Community Excellence Award is presented the thir this 30th day of March, 2023. I was able to be in attendance there as was uh, Assistant Superintendent Stacy Locke. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention all of the support that she has provided in this process as well, uh, along with uh, Nate Henyon, uh, Lieutenant Janice, obviously Matt Murray. Uh, but just to think that every day we are becoming more and more um, uh, responsive, but also then proactively ready uh, to address the needs of our of our students in our community. So it's quite a legacy uh, that both Sarah and uh, uh, through Stacy also uh, have here on our community. So like to present this to her, which I think has already been presented to her, I think. So I'm going to go back and give this to her. Thank you so much. Yes, yes, very good. Are there, are there any questions for Sarah or comments for Sarah? Just before I go on, can we celebrate Sarah a little bit more? Or just congr All right. All right. Con okay. Congratulations. I'm just amazed by the number of families and kids that that program has supported and impacted. It's really a wonderful thing. It's quite amazing to take a program from another community and then perfect it in such a way that they invite you back to uh, learn about the program. So that really speaks volumes of her leadership. And I just can't imagine anybody else in the role. So thank you so much. And uh, yeah, as an added bonus, we can excuse you from the meeting if you'd like. Thank you. All right. The next item that I'd just like to share is the adaptable update. So the Yamate exchange. So I will give the parental component. Uh, so I have uh, four uh, young men from Japan staying in my home. 
Uh, they've been here for, I think, nine days. Um, I've had a headache for about a third of that time. Uh, I now have four teenagers who have a hard time communicating with me and one who refuses to communicate with me. So it's been quite an interesting uh, uh, time, but we're excited about what it's been like as parents to um, look at our community through the lens of tourists and uh, show all of the wonderful things that we have to offer that sometimes are taken for granted. So uh, my wife is, is here, Melanie, and uh, it's just been a wonderful um, opportunity to connect in a way culturally that provides opportunities for for our Japanese exchange students, but also our son in our home and uh, other other individual students with whom they come in contact uh, throughout the day. So it's been very nice for them to not only attend school with my son at Eisenhower, but he's actually part of YB Tech. So he's taking four students to YB Tech. They spend two days in different classes. So it's, it's two days and they flip. So I've worked with um, the principal at uh, YB Tech has just been very wonderful to uh, make sure that uh, that was an option. Otherwise, we would have had them all day at Eisenhower. So it's been nice to see how adaptable uh, YB Tech has been. And uh, the kids have participated in the mornings then at um, two days in electrical, uh, two days in culinary, two days in medical, and two days in um, computer uh, safety, uh, computer security. Cybersecurity, cybersecurity, the matrix, yes. So uh, that's just been wonderful them to see the variety of what we have uh, to offer. And it's uh, probably not something that every student gets to see, but they are benefiting from that, that component. So they will be here through uh, this Friday. They leave Friday at 7 a.m. And just for a very broad or larger update on the group as a whole from a non-parental perspective, but you have been a parent as well of two of these uh, young individuals. I'll turn the time over to Kirsten Fitter. Thank you. Um, well, I wanted to congratulate the board for being so supportive of this exchange. I am seeing the impact this week more than ever. Um, I have uh, had the pleasure of speaking with the Yakima Herald. Um, so you probably did see an article in the paper for that. Um, so that was a wonderful. I also want to publicly thank the uh, Blaine and Pressy Tamaki Foundation as they did infuse our community with funds to uh, take our exchange up a notch as we host the uh, Japanese here. Um, photos have been flooding my email and text. And um, if you look on social media, if you are a follower at the hashtag Yamate2023, you can see all of the activities that these students are engaging in either through our high schools or through the host families. So that's a way that you can share and engage. Um, you know, we haven't done this since 2017. So we have a lot of uh, different leadership in our high schools now than we did at that time. And um, it's been great to see them come in and then see our principals and assistant principals say, oh, now I get it. This is cool. So I'm really looking forward to the next one um, so that, you know, we can embrace uh, even more. And all of the ideas for the next one have been flooding in as well. So it's been a wonderful exchange. We invite you at the board, if you're early birds, come to Davis, maybe about 645 on Friday morning. You will see the tears. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kristen, for uh, all of your work uh, to uh, make this a reality. And I echo the gratitude towards uh, uh, Blaine and uh, Pressy Tamaki and uh, their contributions to making this possible. It's uh, amazing that uh, they would embrace this to such the magnitude that they have. And uh, it would absolutely would not happen without uh, uh, their fantastic generosity. So again, thank you to Blaine and Pressy Tamaki. The last item that I have for the update is just a reminder about the events calendar. Um, so if you look on the screen, we have provided another example and um, uh, Barb is uh, willing to walk you through as board members how to add this to your calendar, but she has worked diligently with our office managers across our system to make sure that we have everything updated on that YSD board superintendent calendar. Everything in the green is something that we, you know, that you could attend. Uh, if it is in red, that means that it is actually full. We do ask that you would reach out and inquire about attending a certain event. Obviously, there are events that you don't have to worry about. Um, sporting events, we could have a, a quorum there as long as you're not talking to each other. But it, just for the 
just to keep on top of things, it would be nice if you would just give a call and just say, Hey, I'm, I'm headed here. Or I, you know, I want to go to this event. And is there an issue with having um, more than two people there? And if not, am I one of the two that could make that happen? So if you take a look, uh, if you take a moment, maybe at home to, to peruse the months and see just how many things that we have going on in the district, it's truly amazing, but it would also give you a wide um, perspective, a great insight of what's happening across our system. And I encourage you to, to take advantage of that. In addition, my uh, visitations to school sites are listed on there. So I do have uh, two hour visits, uh, three, uh, uh, three days a week uh, to schools. The first hour is uh, time that I do spend uh, with the principal uh, and or his, his leadership team, his or her leadership team. Uh, to go over data and to um, work on some leadership uh, opportunities. Uh, but the second hour is reserved for uh, site visitation, classroom walkthroughs and such, and we would invite you to attend those. Uh, also included are your one-on-one -on -one, uh, meetings uh, with me and any other events that uh, relate directly to you. Uh, so that's a way just to keep on top and you could layer that over your actual calendar. Anything to add, Barb? Did I cover all of that? Okay. All right, that's, uh, that concludes the update, and I'll turn it back over to President Walker. Thank you. Well, I did load the calendar on and discovered that in my iPhone, the colors changed. Uh oh. So it's different. So just be prepared for that. Plus, it filled up my entire calendar. So All of a sudden, you're busy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm a really busy person now. <laughs> anyway, it's, I, I need to find a way maybe to keep a separate calendar is the way to do that so that it, you'll have to show me how to do that because when I loaded it it just it just filled in my calendar so anyway okay well that takes us to our next topic calendar updates and future agenda topics and First item there we have, we talked last time about the proposal to move our retreat from August 7th to August 14th and provided the rationale, but have you had a chance to look at your calendars and is that going to work for the rest of us? And, It'll work for me. Okay. Then we'll, you don't know, have to follow up with Graciela and, and Ryan. Okay. Yeah, we can just, we can hold on that for another week. And then graduation and celebration dates, those should be in that uh, calendar. The shared calendar should already be there. Um, and then we have the policy governance in the board meeting calendars. So those are attached. So you may want to just check those and make sure that that fits with your calendar. I don't think I'll go through those item by item. Oops. Next week we're at Robertson, is that yes. right? Yes, that's, I believe so. First of May, yeah, we're at Robertson. And then we have the policy governance um, calendar for, that's been updated for policy review. So that's also attached. Again, I don't think we need to go through that piece by piece, but there it is for you. And then graduation dates should be on the shared calendar. And we don't need to worry about um, quorum for any of the graduations either do we that's not an issue okay so i i will try to make as many of those as i can but again make as many as you can but it's not an obligation if it gets to be overwhelming or you need family time or work time or whatever but Gradu obviously graduations are an obligation yeah well and uh, and honors convocation yeah usually <laughs> But I think there are some that are optional, like the HAB celebration might be optional mm -hmm. if it's difficult to make. Or I know the regular graduations, the Native American celebration is not a graduation. Black elegance is not a graduation. So as long as we have someone there to represent the board, um, we'll be okay. But yes, the actual graduations, we're all expected to be with those. 
Thanks for clarifying that. <laughs> I misspoke there. Okay, any questions about those? Okay, we have arrived at our first opportunity for comments from the public. Is there anyone signed up? Not at this time, and we put both okay, together. Thank you. Is there a need for executive session today? Not at this time. No need. <laughs> check check your check your mailbox. <laughs> okay. So no, no need. And actually, I only see one opportunity for comments from the public, and we don't have anybody for that one. So, is there any other comment, questions, needs? With that, we can adjourn. Do we need a motion to adjourn? Okay. We are adjourned. I'm getting the hand signal from Jake. <laughs>